My name is Eddie Ruiz, and I exist to help you sharpen your biblical mindsets to love God and love others well. And welcome to part one of the unpacking of this conversation, specifically between George and Cliff Nectol, where we're going to be extracting some of the biblical insights and expanding on the concepts so we can learn and apply to our life. And just as a reminder, we're not here to hate anybody in the video or judge anybody for what they're saying or what they're believing. So let's go ahead and jump right into the video. I, I have a question for you. Um, how does a man who does not know Christ at all, wasn't born in a religion that serves Christ. Um, and if he is, by the way, I'm talking as if I'm not a Christian. Good clarity. Uh, and if he is the way, the truth, the life, how is it that a man who's so far away from God, isn't it kind of unfair that he starts out at a different spot than a man who was born mm. in a Christian home that knows God? It, it, does God love him less than the man that was born in a Christian home? And how does he answer his calls? So George asks the question, does a man who's not raised in a Christian home, does he have less of a chance, basically? Does God love him less than the man who was raised in a Christian home? And to start, I think that question is a good question, but I think it's a bit misguided. And here's why, because he was raised in a country, he was born in Chicago, Illinois. He's raised in a country where God is as common as McDonald's or any other fast food restaurant. He is an option. He's on every corner. Everybody knows God. Everybody knows Jesus, or so they think. And the thing is that when God becomes common, he becomes easily dismissible and easily optional. And so although it's a really good question, the lens that he's approaching it from is from a guy who was raised in a country where God is everywhere. But the biblical truth of God's love is that it's reserved for those who would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior and that would accept the Son of God. In so much that his love was inclusive on the cross, giving everybody the opportunity to come to Jesus as Lord and Savior. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that anyone who would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world inclusive that he gave his only begotten son that anyone who would believe in him would have eternal life exclusive so jesus's love is inclusive on the cross for everybody but it's exclusive in a relationship with him because they have to accept him as lord and savior which by the way is not the most popular thing to say that a relationship with jesus is exclusive but that's just the biblical truth take it or leave it so to answer the question plainly no, God does not love the guy who was raised in a Christian house more than the guy who wasn't. Just ask anybody who lives in a foreign country where Christianity is not the predominant religion, where religions like Hinduism or Islam are the predominant rule and people still come to faith in Jesus Christ in these countries. It's not as easy for them as it is for us because we can pick and choose what church we go to this weekend or what church we watch online because God in America is common so common that he's become dismissible. God's love is reserved for those who would receive Jesus, so there's no preference in upbringing. Where my parents molded me as a child, and I find that to be the most important part of a childhood, and that's why I am very heartbroken to see what's going on in schools now, mm. because we're forgetting that kids are empty vessels. When they're young, you could fill them into whatever. If I have a child here and I say, hey, shoes are God, this boy is gonna believe that the shoes are God. So how is it fair that a man who is far away from Jesus when he's born, how, what, what's his relationship with God and how can he find God the same way that a Christian man found God in a home where his mother goes, Christ is the That's way, the question. truth, the life? That's a very sensitive, thoughtful question, George. And you're right, it's not fair. You're absolutely right. I love how Cliff just jumps into the question behind the question, the fundamental idea that life is not fair. It doesn't take a rocket scientist or a PhD in psychology to know that Life isn't fair. If you've been through hardships or heartbreaks, you get it. Life isn't fair. And the Bible highlights that really well. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, King Solomon is the wisest man that's ever lived. The Bible says that he's the richest and wisest man who has lived and will ever live. And he says this about life not being fair. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. So the Bible connects with us relationally, telling us that life isn't fair. And it's important for you to know that because sometimes people think that the Bible doesn't talk about these topics, but it absolutely does. Goods are not fair. All of our parents hurt us in some way and 
Although I love the living daylights out of this guy, I, because of my sinfulness, hurt him. And I hurt his two brothers as well. When I sinned, when I lost mm. my temper, when I was selfish, I hurt my kids. And my parents hurt me. So you're right. Life is not fair. Okay, so what do you do with a person who says, well, Cliff, I'm just at the beginning. What do I do? I say, you know, I wish you and I could take a trip to the Grand Canyon. And as we're standing there at the edge of the Grand Canyon, if I say to you, wow, aren't I awesome? <laughs> <laughs> That's embarrassing. Cliff, you're standing in front of the Grand Canyon. It is so awe-inspiring. And what are you caught up with? Myself. Mm. Okay, now we're not going to be able to do that, are we, George? You and I are not going to be able to go to the Grand Canyon today or tomorrow. All we got to do is go out tonight when it's real dark. Look about the moon and the stars. Begin to contemplate the vastness of the galaxy, the vastness of the universe. Am I going to stand there and say, wow, George, aren't I awesome? That is to part company with reality. Mm. Yes, we are awesome because God created us, and that's good. Mm -hmm. But there is something, someone far bigger than Cliff, far bigger than all of us put together. Yeah. And when you begin to contemplate that and allow the awesomeness of God, the awesomeness of the majesty of his creation to sink in, you're beginning to open up your heart to God. I love this explanation that it's not just about fairness or unfairness, where you were raised or where you weren't raised, what you've heard or not heard. He's saying that there's visible qualities in creation that point to God. It's almost like God's calling card to us is all his visible creations. And what happens with Cliff is that he has like a like a Rolodex of scripture constantly running through his head. And I know exactly where he's pointing to. He's pointing to Romans 1 20 in the context of God's wrath on unrighteousness. Romans 1 20 says this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So what Paul is highlighting there is that on the day of judgment, when we're standing in front of God, none of us are going to have an excuse to actually deny him. Because even if you're in the middle of nowhere and no one ever preaches the gospel to you, God's attributes are visible to us in his creation. The stars point to him, the rocks point to him, the trees point to him, everything that's visible points to God as, like I said before, a calling card. So there's no reason and there's no excuse to deny him. And in today's context where there are so many people who, because of their knowledge, don't believe in God or they don't believe in the existence of Jesus or any of the historical evidence or any of that stuff, it's comforting to know that there nobody will be without excuse on the day of judgment. And if you're listening to this video right now, if you're watching this, you've already heard the gospel. So you don't have an excuse either. And then the second thing I would encourage people to do is read the Gospels. Don't start in Genesis in the Bible in the beginning. Go mm. three quarters of the way through to the New Testament, the first four books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because that's the eyewitness account of Jesus of Nazareth, how he lived, how he treated people, what he taught ethically, how he died, praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Man, I'd have been saying, God, nail those suckers for nailing me to a cross. Mm. Not Christ. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But fourthly and most importantly, in those Gospels, read about how three days after he died, he physically bodily rose from the dead. That's fantastic advice about where to start in the Bible, especially because there's so many Bibles everywhere. The Bible's accessible in so many different languages, in so many different translations. You have a Bible app that has all the translations in them. Where do you start reading? And when anybody asks me, Eddie, where do I start reading when I read the Bible? I tell them, start where Jesus starts. But why? Why start where Jesus starts? Why shouldn't I just start at Genesis? And it's simple because where Jesus is, is where our eternal relationship is. And it starts at the resurrection. The entire Bible points to Jesus from cover to cover, from the Mosaic law passed down to the Israelites in the wilderness, to the revelation of John in isolation on the island of Patmos. Jesus is everywhere in scripture from cover to cover. And in Luke 24, 27, when these two disciples are on the road to Emmaus, a city called Emmaus, Jesus shows up to them after the resurrection and starts just hanging out with them and talking with them. And as they're walking together, the disciples are asking Jesus, like, are you new here? Like, have you not heard about the resurrection and all these, all these things that have happened in the last three years? And then Jesus starts to tell them the story, the real story of the gospel. And Luke 24, 27 says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Jesus highlights where in the Bible he is, and he's pointing backwards to the Old Testament because the New Testament wasn't written yet. Now, this Jesus who rose from the dead said, I love you, God loves you. Guess what, George? If you die and rise from the dead, I will listen very carefully to everything mm. you have to say. 
because the evidence is you're in touch with reality. All right, that's exactly what Jesus pulled off. He died, he rose from the dead. And so when he says that God loves you and that God has a future for you that includes eternity when you put your faith in him and accept that invitation that you talked about so beautifully at the beginning of this show, wow, you, let's open up and let's receive him into our lives as our Savior and Lord. What a great reminder that even if we're sharing the truth of Jesus, it's not what we're saying, it's how we say it. We're planting seeds and just like a farmer or a person who has a garden is very gentle planting the seeds, so do we need to be when we're having conversations with other people. Not because we're concerned about offending them. The gospel is offensive to those who don't believe period, but because we want to gain a deeper understanding of who they are before we just start attacking and saying things that are just out of context. If I were to walk up to you and tell you, hey man, you want to know the truth about the gospel? Jesus died for you. That may work 1% of the time, but there's a difference between saying, hey, God died for you and saying, hey man, what's your name? Oh, where do you go to church? Oh, you don't go to church. Interesting. Oh, you start having a deeper conversation with people when you actually desire to get to know them personally the same way that when Jesus walked around he was getting to know the people around him he wasn't just shouting in their faces if anything he reserves the scolding for the Pharisees who think they know God not for people who didn't know God he reserves that for people who were self-righteous and self-seeking and their pharisaical and their thinking it was all about them and what they were getting out of God but Jesus got to know the people around him he sat and ate with them. When the Bible says that he sat down to eat with tax collectors and sinners, he wasn't quiet the entire time at dinner. He was having dinner with them and getting to know them, to get to know their hearts and become relatable to them. So should we be the same when we're spreading the gospel of Jesus in love. And we're reminded in Colossians 4 in the context of how we treat outsiders and it says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Have you ever eaten food that has no salt on it? Oh, it's not good. It, it's it, it's it's bad. Like if you ever had barbecue without without salt, you you probably wouldn't go back to that place. And it keeps saying so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So with regards to outsiders or people who don't know about Jesus or don't know about the faith, it's important that we truly treat them with respect love and kindness that they deserve because they're humans just like us. We debate or we have a, a conversation and also with fellow Christians. I say, pray to your God and have him open my eyes if it be true. Mm -hmm. And I pray to my God mm -hmm. that he opens your eyes. And I, and I just pray that people could be on this level of um, respect mm -hmm. because then there's no room for war because then we're putting it on our God. And in that boat, they very much knew whose God it was. And I feel like that is where we need to play ball at. Not I'm going to kill you if you don't see it from my point of view. <laughs> but if your God truly exists, wouldn't you want it to leave it in his hands? Hey, Very God, I, I love this man, Sam. I, I just, you know, he he believes more in um, the Big Bang than he believes in you. I pray that you open up his eyes and heart. And I feel like praying for people and praying with people is not talked about enough. One of the biggest challenges we face as Christians is actually prayer. But why? It's not because people don't think it doesn't work or people don't think it's necessary. It's simply because it's so easy to not do that we actually become apathetic towards it and decide that nah, we just don't have time for it. We treat it almost like that, <laughs> that diet that we're going to start next Monday. There's always a next Monday or that fitness plan that, you know what, I need to get back into shape, but I'll start next Monday. And because it's so easy to do or not do, and we tend to overcomplicate it, we become apathetic towards it. And in the context of the final instructions to the Thessalonians, Thessalonian church, Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, pray without ceasing. So prayer is not about if you like to do it or not. It's just so necessary for our spiritual health. But to bring it back to what George is saying, why is it important to pray with other people? Because the Bible tells us that when two people are in agreement with each other about anything, God shows up. And here Jesus in Matthew 18, in the context of when a brother sins against you or church discipline, he says something in regards to this very thing. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So it's important to pray with 
people. Thanks for hanging out with me as we unpack the biblical insights in the conversation between George and Cliff. And I pray that this video helps you take more steps to follow Jesus in your everyday life, because it's not about knowing more. It's about practically using what you know to follow Jesus well. And remember, friends, keep it biblical, and I'll see you in the next one.